Hello travelers and welcome to Adventures in Myth and History. In this video, we explore the settling of Jamestown, examining the initial year, a rough time leading to the starving time, a time when hundreds of the settlers died, died because of their own mismanagement and the actions of the local Indians. This is the first in a series of videos that tracks Jamestown from its beginning through the Powhatan Wars that nearly destroyed the colony and certainly resulted in the destruction of the Powhatan Confederation. Be sure to support this channel by clicking the thumbs up and subscribing. I welcome your comments. The script, formatted as a study guide, along with the bibliography, are available in the video description. England was late to the colonization of the New World, largely because it had little money. However, the island nation was not about to be left behind by Spain, Portugal, and the Dutch. So the crown made it possible for privately owned companies, like joint stock companies, to be issued a charter or patent for settlement in North America. The Virginia Company was one of the first to take advantage of this opportunity. Its investors pooled their resources and engaged three ships, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. And they gathered 104 settlers. The settlers were all men, men who were entirely focused on making their fortunes and nothing else. This objective, and the fact that at least half of the settlers were gentlemen and the other half artisans, created a serious, almost irrecoverable situation. But more on that later. Another important point is that the settlers were all bound to the company, indentured, for five to seven years. No one would be able to leave the colony without the express permission of the company's management, or at least that was the intent. One exception to the gentleman artisan category was Captain John Smith. Born in 1580 to a simple family, Smith was not a gentleman or artisan. He was an experienced soldier. Although only 5'3", he was stocky, tough, and had the wherewithal to make the tough decisions and deal with the Indians, when allowed to do so. In December 1606, the ships left Blackwell, now known as the London Docks, with Christopher Newton, captain of the Susan Constant, in overall command. By the time the ships reached the Canaries, the gentlemen had enough of Smith trying to tell them how to do things. Consequently, Smith was accused of inciting insurrection. Upon the scandalous suggestion of some of the chief, envying his report, who feigned he intended to usurp the government, murder the council, and make himself king. It was just the first of multiple attempts during our story, in which the gentleman, seeing Smith as a lesser form of being, a being like all people not in their class, attempted to push Smith out of the way. All of these attempts relied on making up facts to make Smith look guilty of a crime. Smith was confined for the remainder of the voyage. The ship sighted Martinique on March 23, 1606, but continued on to Dominica, where they dropped anchor to refresh their food and water supplies. They island hopped for the next 18 days and then set course for due north. After 10 days, they reached the Chesapeake Bay, their chartered land. It's a good thing it took no longer. The gentlemen were becoming impatient, talking about sailing back to England. They reached Chesapeake on April 26th. As with the rest of North America, the Chesapeake Bay area was inhabited by Native Americans. In this case, the powerful Powhatan Confederation, a union of about 30 tribes under the paramount chief Wahun Seneca. Wahun Seneca was also known as Powhatan, from which the confederation took its name. Wahun Seneca had started with six tribes, tribes led by his father. He completed the consolidation of the remaining 24 shortly before the arrival of the Jamestown settlers, resulting in the English facing a confederation of between 15,000 and 20,000 people, extending from Virginia through North Carolina. When this, within this area, an area they called Sinacomica, the Powhatan fished, hunted, farmed, and migrated as needed. The ships initially dropped anchor at a spot they called Cape Henry and sent a party of 30, led by Newport, 
to scout for a settlement location. The men explored for a day before heading back to the ships, but before reaching the ships, they were suddenly attacked by Indians, resulting in two severe injuries. After the English fired their muskets at the attackers, the attackers faded away. Deciding they needed a place they could better defend, and a place they believed would be better suited for settlement, they sailed to a peninsula they called Jamestown, arriving on May 13, 1607. Jamestown had a good, deep harbor and was easy to defend. The settlers stayed aboard the first night, debarking the next day, May 14th, and taking their supplies ashore. Now that they had arrived, they were allowed to open a chest with papers, papers in which the owners specified the makeup of the ruling council and their expectations, including exploring the area looking for mining opportunities. To the frustration of the gentlemen, the instructions named John Smith as a member of the council. Edward Wingfield was named council president. Because the owners wrote in the council's instructions to curry favor with the Indians, favor without violence, Winfield gave instructions that banned the construction of fortifications or the uncrating of the weapons. He wanted to make a peaceful impression on the native peoples. An interesting decision given the attack at Cape Henry, a decision that would soon prove rash. Shortly after their arrival, the council sent Smith out with a party to explore the surrounding country. He met several tribes that warmly welcomed them with food, drink, and overnight shelter. Smith was given a guide who was to eventually take them back to the English settlement when the mission ended. Eventually, the guide communicated to Smith that he wasn't going to go back with them to the settlement, nor could he continue to guide them. This and the changing attitudes of some of the Indians they encountered made Smith nervous about the welfare of the settlement. He decided to immediately return. Smith was right to worry. When his party arrived back at Jamestown, they found that it had been attacked by about 400 warriors. Because there were no fortifications, and because all of the weapons were still crated, the settlers were initially caught with their proverbial pants down. The English largely kept their heads and quickly mounted a defense. Cannon fire from the ships was the deciding factor, causing the Indians to withdraw when a ball hit a large branch, knocking it down, panicking the Indians. Smith wrote, Had it not chanced a crossbar shot from the ship struck down a bough from a tree amongst them, that caused them to retire, our men had all been slain, being securely all at work, and their arms in dry fats. Believed it was a test of their abilities by Wahoon Seneca. The attack resulted in between 11 and 17 men being struck with arrows, wounds that resulted in one death. The weapons were unpacked, and a palisade started. The settlers refused to farm. The gentlemen, because they were above working the soil, and the artisans, because that wasn't their job. However, everyone did spend some time building the palisade, some dwellings, and storage for the food gotten from the Indians. In the midst of this improvement project, the settlers faced frequent Indian skirmishes. Let's hear about two instances and the words of those who were there. On May 31st, Sunday they came lurking in the thickets and long grass, and a gentleman won Euston's Clovel, unarmed, Straggling without the fort, they shot six arrows into him, wherewith he came running into arm, these sticking still, he lived eight days, and died. The savages stayed not, but run away. On June 1st, Monday some twenty appeared, shot divers arrows at random which fell short of our fort, and ran away. Not all Indians were hostile to the settlers. Some friendly tribes told the council that their settlement was being targeted by the Paspahe, a people who claimed the peninsula on which Jamestown sat, and they, would, and they would try to intercede to get the attack stopped. This was the beginning of the general relationship between the Indians and the English for the next year or so. The tribes near the settlers were much less friendly than those located farther away. The treatment of the Indians by the Europeans settler arrogance regarding a people they called savages, their lack of understanding about Indian trade and social practices, 
and the eventual settler habit of forcibly extracting their needs from the Indians affected these tribes first, the closest tribes, first and more deeply. Newport and the ships he commanded were never meant to remain permanently at Jamestown. Newton left with the Susan Constant and the Godspeed, leaving the discovery with the settlers. The settlers would rely on small vessels, like the shallop, to explore and fish. Newport's crew had done much of the work needed to be build up the settlement, so with the departure of the ships, a capable workforce was leaving Jamestown. Work on the settlement all but stopped. Winter was coming, but many of the men still lived in tents, with no intent on building themselves a shelter. As I mentioned earlier, none of the men would farm, happy to wait until Newport returned with fresh supplies, or they just eat what they could get from the Indians. Conditions in the colony were dire before Newport left, and became even worse after. Jamestown was built on lowlands, lands that the Indians regarded as too poor for settlement. Fresh water was in short supply, causing the settlers to drink from the local river, a river that is always at some level of saltiness. Finally, there was little to no management of how the supplies were used, resulting in the settlement running out of food. George Percy, a member of the council, writes, Our men were destroyed with cruel diseases such as swellings, flixes, burning fevers, and by wars, but for the most part, they died of mere famine. John Smith writes, This time our diet was foremost part water and bran, and three ounces of little better stuff in bread for five men a meal, and thus we lived near three months. Our lodgings under boughs of trees, the savages being our enemies, whom we neither knew nor understood, occasion I think sufficient to make men sick and die. Nearly 50% of the settlers died. Some historians believe that much of the death was caused by emotional death, the loss of any emotional connection to anything or anyone, including life caused by severe psychological and emotional trauma. In other words, many of the men simply gave up due to the conditions under which they lived, seeing no hope for relief. On September 10, 1607, Wingfield was removed as governor, with accusations of malfeasance, including hiding food for the use of his cronies and himself. John Ratcliffe, born John Sycamore, the captain of the Discovery, was selected as the new governor. As autumn moved across the land, Wahoon Seneca decided to offer his friendship. After their fall harvest, the Indians began bringing corn to feed the settlers. In addition, the council appointed Smith as their collector of food, working with the tribes to trade for corn and hunting for protein. This was all that kept the settlers alive, because as late as November, Newport had not yet returned with new supplies, supplies to feed a group of English who would not work sufficiently to feed themselves. The council decided to send Smith out on another exploration mission. This time he was to search for a passage to the Pacific, along the Chickahominy River. As an aside, many Europeans had no idea how wide North America was. Smith's team didn't get far before they were killed by the Chickahominy Indians. Well, all but Smith, who was spared, and was paraded through various villages, spending Christmas 1607 in captivity. On about December 27th, he was taken to see Wahun Seneca in his village, Werawokomoko. Wahun Seneca doomed Smith to death, causing him to lie his head on a stone in order to bash in his skull. But the chief's daughter, Pocahontas, a young teen, possibly thirteen, allegedly threw herself between the club man and Smith, begging for his life. Wahoon Seneca placed Smith back into custody, deciding to spare him. Two days later, December 30th, Wahoon Seneca released Smith, calling him friend, and offering Smith land and esteem as Wahoon Seneca's son, if he returned with two great guns and a grindstone. Smith returned to Jamestown on January 2nd, 1608, with several of Wahoon Seneca's men, only to find that 40 of the settlers were still alive. 
he also saw that some of the settlers were preparing the discovery for a return to England. Smith immediately stopped the work and confronted the council. As for the great guns for Wadhoon Seneca, Smith hedged and told the Indians with him that they could take two large cannon. However, they were unable to carry them back to the village and left without. Without proper management of resources, the settlers had gone through all of the food Smith had collected before his capture. As I said earlier, malnutrition, disease, and psychological trauma all contributed to the continuous deaths. In order to get Smith out of the way so they could get on with preparing the discovery for return to England, the council quickly tried him and found him guilty of the deaths of his team when he was captured. They condemned him to death. The night before Smith's execution, Newton returned with supplies and 70 more settlers. Maybe the first American example of the cavalry arriving just in time. Newton released Smith and the new settlers came ashore on January 7, 1608. One of the new men accidentally started a fire, which burned buildings within the fort, including the storehouse. While many of the new supplies were burned, some were still on the ships. This food and the continued trade with the Indians helped the old and new, sur new settlers survive through the winter. The settlers still refused to help themselves. All they cared about, according to Smith, was finding gilded dirt, dirt containing gold or silver. But Smith saw the riches all around the settlement that were ignored, cedar, fish, and iron. Although the council initially resisted sending this, car this kind of cargo back to England, they finally relented when no precious metals were found. Radcliffe and the council decided that they needed to discredit Smith, who was sending his assessment to back to the company with Newton. Newton and his crew were held up for three and a half months while the council tried to gather mostly false reports about Smith for their own report. Newport finally departed on April 10, 1608, after his crew had gone through many of the supplies intended for the settlers. This late departure also delayed the next supply trip. Just before Newport's April departure, Wahoon Seneca sent Newport 20 turkeys with a request for 20 swords. Newport, wanting to maintain good relations with the Indians, granted the request. This causes Wahoo Seneca to try this same trade with John Smith. Smith refused to provide the Indians with the weapons, a decision that began increased friction between Wahoon Seneca and Smith. Wahoon Seneca told his people to steal anything they couldn't trade for, including weapons and tools, causing a series of skirmishes as Indian intruders were detected. Still, some Indians managed to steal spades, shovels, and other tools. Some of the thieves were captured and one placed in the stocks. Smith told Wahoon Seneca that he could have the Indian prisoners back if the tools were returned. Instead of returning the tools, however, Wahoon Seneca captured two English prisoners, offering to swap them for his people. Smith, though, had a way of dealing with the Indians when he believed they were misbehaving. He burned one or more villages, a burning without killing the inhabitants. So, in response to Wahoon Seneca's swap proposal, Smith burned several villages causing Wahoon Seneca to return the English prisoners the next day, a return that did not include returning the Indian prisoners. This was just the beginning of a big change in the settler relationship with the Powhatan. Meanwhile, the Phoenix, commanded by Thomas Nelson, arrived with more supplies and between 40 to 60 new settlers. Nelson had been with Newton, but was blown off course in a storm and had spent the winter in the West Indies. Well, that's it for this video. We've seen how the settlers came to be present in Jamestown and problems they encountered during their first year, problems largely caused by their own unwillingness to do the work, and made worse by the increasing Indian hostilities. In the next video, I look at the summer of 1608 and its results, the starving time of the winter of 1608 to 1609. As you can see, the topics we'll discuss in this channel will analyze both ancient and current beliefs. There's no correct answer for most of what we cover when we do this. Instead, we explore and come to tentative conclusions based on what we learn 
while being open to changing our beliefs when additional information becomes available. Please subscribe if you learned something or were challenged by what I covered in this video. Until next time, keep an open mind.